Right, so here we go, I guess. <clears throat> This year, I wanted to start off right with a video that sets the tone of my channel moving forward with what I aim to do with my content in the future. Ever since Steven Universe ended, I've been getting loads of comments asking what I'm going to do with my channel and make content for. And even though my channel has been in a prosperous period without hardly any serious Steven Universe content in sight for almost an entire year now, it's still something that I'm frequently asked. But if you've noticed and have been here for a long time, I'm not uploading nearly as frequently as I used to when I first started YouTube. And to give a proper explanation for both why that is and what I'm going to be doing in the future, we need to get one eensy teensy topic out of the way first. Special interests and hyperfixations. Those of you who are watching this video may or may not know this about me, but I have ASD. ASD is the acronym for Autism Spectrum Disorder and was the diagnosis that replaced Asperger's Syndrome back in 2013, because doctors found it to be a far more accurate description for the disability. The decision to change the name isn't really pertinent to the topic of this video, I guess, but it is a little fun fact that I've realized not a lot of people know. People diagnosed with Asperger's can still feel free to use that diagnosis if they feel more comfortable with it, of course, but just know that ASD effectively serves the same purpose both label and diagnosis-wise, if you were confused as to where that term came from. All of this is just a complicated way to say that yes, I am autistic. One of the most popular videos that I have on the channel is actually where I talk about autism representation in the media. So this is mainly for those of you who really liked that video and subscribed hoping for something similar in the future. Needless to say though, I am not by any means a medical professional. I am just an autistic person speaking about my own autistic experience, and I don't really have the authority or final say over anything that I'm talking about here. We all experience things differently and that's why it's called a spectrum disorder. Disclaimers done and out of the way though, what are special interests and hyperfixations? And why did I say that that's been preventing me from making consistent content for roughly the past year? I'm sure my fellow neurodivergent peers already know the answer and what I'm getting at here, but for those of you who don't, I'll explain the basics really quick. It's also important to note briefly that before we continue, that while special interest is a term exclusively used by autistic people or people on the spectrum, hyperfixation is a term that is used by all other neurodivergent folks. Hyperfixation is most commonly attributed to people with ADHD, but is not exclusive to just that disability. The line is sort of blurred between how the two differ, but the consensus based on my research and conversations seems to be that special interests are more often more consistent and long-term than hyperfixations are. The two are slightly different based on their origin, but share more similarities than they do differences. And of course, depending on the person, hyperfixations can be just as intense and long-lasting as special interests are. They've been designated different names because of the origin of their disability and not necessarily because they're consistently different from each other in terms of expression. So because of that, I'll be talking about them both as this sort of broad experience. There's a lot of overlap between multiple developmental disabilities, particularly between ASD and ADHD, which is where a lot of the confusion and mix-up with the terminology comes from. For example, hyperfocus is a term that can be used both by people with ASD and ADHD, but is usually considered to be an exclusive term to individuals with those disabilities, whereas hyperfixation is not and can be used by anyone who is developmentally, intellectually, and or mentally disabled. It's a lot to remember, and I'll be linking a post that I feel explains the differences rather well in the description. In addition to knowing the proper usage of these terms and who experiences them, here's some language that you should know as well, since I've seen a lot of confusion surrounding the modern terms. They're still fairly new, so I don't really blame anyone for not knowing what they mean. Key definitions and explanations. Neurodivergent. A neurodivergent person is defined as one whose neurological development and state are atypical, usually viewed as abnormal or extreme. So this means someone who may have ASD, ADHD, a personality disorder, or other mental disabilities such as dyslexia or dyscalculia. Someone saying that they're neurodivergent doesn't necessarily mean that they're autistic, it just means that they're neurologically atypical. Reminder that while these things are disabilities, they are not considered to be flaws. Disabled is not a dirty word. 
neurotypical, not displaying or characterized by autistic or other neurologically atypical patterns of thoughts or behavior. This simply means that you aren't neurodivergent. ASD. We already went over this one in the intro, but ASD is short for Autism Spectrum Disorder. It replaced Asperger's Syndrome back in 2013. Allistic. Someone who is not autistic. You can be neurodivergent and allistic. You can have ADHD and be allistic. It simply means that you do not have ASD. Special Interest. To have a deep, intense, passionate, and incredibly focused narrow interest in a certain area of study, subject, topic, or thing, to the exclusion of other interests. This interest is something that exists for the long term, most often lasting multiple months, years, or even for your entire life. Less commonly, the last a couple of weeks. This is considered to be a term used exclusively by people with autism and not by those with other mental disabilities. Hyperfixation, an umbrella term used to describe special interest, hyperfocus, perseverations, and other intense obsessions in those with developmental, learning, or mental disabilities. Commonly most used by people with ADHD to substitute the term special interest, since special interest is widely agreed upon to be an ASD exclusive term. This term is not exclusive towards people with ADHD and is the correct term to use if you're neurodivergent but not autistic. Hyperfocus. To focus intensely on something for a short-term period of time without break to the exclusion of all other things. This is to the point that you won't process what's going on around you, adhere to your bodily functions and needs, homework or tasks, your hobbies or interests, etc. This is a term that's usually exclusive for people with ADHD or ASD. Actually, ADHD on Tumblr described it best by saying, you can hyper-focus on something that you're especially interested in, but you can also hyper-focus on stuff that you're not especially interested in. That's how you can end up playing a video game for five hours without realizing how much time has gone by and wonder why you were even playing the game to begin with since it's not your favorite. Differences between hyperfixation and hyperfocus. Okay, so with those simple but fundamental definitions out of the way, it's time for us to get into explaining the complexities of special interests, hyperfixations, and hyperfocus. These terms seem to have created a lot of confusion in groups just learning about them through individual research, particularly in leftist online spaces. They aren't the same thing, no matter how they tend to be grouped together and talked about together. And while they sometimes overlap and exist side by side, they are still too Two very different things. A special interest, for example, can be best described as an intense and passionate level of focus on things of interest over a long period of time, sometimes lifelong. Hyperfixation is essentially the same, but may be experienced differently since it's generally the umbrella term that is used by all neurodivergent people. Hyperfocus differs from both and can be best described as being fully and 100% immersed in something to the point of being unable to break your focus on whatever it is that you're hyperfocused on. The difference between the two can best be described like this. Hyperfocusing is when you concentrate on one activity or task for a prolonged period of time, far beyond what a neurotypical person typically does. Hyperfocus can sometimes involve a topic rather than a task, but not always. For example, the task may be on an interest because it's researching facts about dolphins for five hours without noticing that it's 4 a.m. and you stayed up all night on a school or work night. Or it could simply be playing a video game all day and not noticing anything around you, including your need to eat, sleep, or go to the bathroom, despite your body giving you very clear indications and warnings. It's basically an extreme case of, whoops, I lost track of time. And of course, it really depends and varies. Both people with ASD and ADHD experience this, even if it's depicted more commonly when talking about the later. A special interest or hyperfixation is the subject of intense interest that continues past active immersion of a singular task and may or may not not be tied to a certain task or activity. Oftentimes, it isn't. A special interest usually falls under one specific subject, such as a series or a movie, and oftentimes extends to non-fiction sources, such as taking an interest in a specific time period of history, a certain animal, trains, or literally anything that you can think of can become a subject of interest. It is important to note that you can become hyper-focused on something that isn't your special interest or hyper-fixation. It doesn't need to be something that you're actually interested interested in for you to become fixated on it. Sometimes you can even become hyper fixated out of fear, such as looking up an illness and spending all day doom scrolling and scaring yourself into thinking that you have cancer because of Mayo Clinic. We've all been there. This can happen with literally any activity to the point that you may forget to take care of your basic needs, even if it's to eat or sleep. 
Like for me personally, I can become hyper-focused on writing even if my special interest isn't involved. The majority of my scripts were only finished because I was able to zone in on them and write them all in one day, even if it's typically a struggle to reach what I call the zone. I'm the type of person who writes continuously over a prolonged period of time even if it's skipping two days worth of sleep to write a 20 plus page script in one go. I either get out what I need in one sitting or I take a two month break and come back to it when I can focus on it again. There really is no in between and it makes getting stuff out frequently to be difficult as you can clearly see but when it does work, I'm productive to the point of making my own head spin. While there are breaks from hyper-focus since it's generally activity-based, special interests are usually constant. Again, this varies person to person. One frustrating comment that I get whenever I talk about this subject is something along the lines of, everyone has interests and problems focusing on stuff they don't like. If you're really saying that anyone who's passionate about something is autistic, that makes half the world autistic. In fact, I'm pretty sure people are already typing that out right now if they haven't already. And to that I say, no, you literally don't understand and I think you just don't understand people with mental disabilities. Hyperfocus, special interest, and hyperfixations are incredibly hard to explain to people who have never experienced the symptoms from having ASD or ADHD because there aren't similar experiences that they've had that we can compare it to. And I think that's where we're going wrong in trying to explain it to people because there's really nothing to give in comparison. By virtue, that makes it difficult for there to be an empathetic connection and form an understanding. These aren't the same as a passion or general interest in something, since in those cases I'm sure it wouldn't have the potential of impacting every single portion of your life. And I'm pretty sure that you also wouldn't hate a passion, because some hyperfixations and some special interests you're hyperfixated on and you might not even like them, it's just because you're hyperfixated on it. Like. <laughs> Special interests and hyperfixations go beyond simply having an interest in something, and a hyperfocus goes beyond simply being focused on something. Because if that's all they were, you're right, I would be explaining half of the population. But that isn't what either of these things are, and acting like they are is sort of ignorant. These aren't terms that we've pulled out of thin air, they're literally medically recognized terms. I realize too that the difference doesn't seem to be super large between the two. And again, this is where I understand the confusion because there is a lot that overlaps. I tried to avoid the word obsession here while explaining these conditions because that isn't really what it is, though I suppose that it is the closest definition that would help a neurotypical to understand it. Just try not to think of it automatically with negative connotations like obsession generally is. Something interesting of note as well is that someone with ASD can have more than one special interest at one time. I know it's common to believe that there's only one subject of interest per person, especially in the context of when it's depicted in the media, but that often isn't the case. Like with me, for example, my current special interests as of writing this video are Infinity Train being my primary and Miraculous Ladybug being my secondary, which honestly checks out if you look at my recent video upload or Twitter history. I hope that this makes sense because there isn't really a whole hell of a lot of information out there explaining the difference. Literally, if you Google it, you're more likely to be brought to Reddit instead of a specialized organization. And while Reddit can have good information, it really shouldn't be the first thing that comes up in search results, if that makes sense. I'm not trying to really diss on Reddit or anything. Differences having now been explained though, I wanted to talk a little bit about special interest individually and some common misconceptions and the problems that come along with them. Special Interests and Hyperfixations when I talk about special interest and hyperfixations, it's always difficult to do so in a way that accurately describes what it's like having one. And again, this is really difficult to do for someone who doesn't experience it. There's a lot of misconceptions and I think miscommunication on what it is, even in a previous video where I briefly talked about it before. So I'm going to try and clear up a few things here and paint a somewhat accurate picture, at least accurate for me and my experience. One very common misconception is that people choose what they want their special interest to be. And this really isn't the case. At least in my experience, it really isn't. Do you honestly think that I would willingly choose to like Miraculous Ladybug if I had the choice? 
My experience in history with special interest has a weird pattern that it always seems to follow, and I'm curious if anyone else finds it familiar. My very first special interest was on Winnie the Pooh when I was super little. Despite having most late 1900s Disney collections and cartoons, it was always what I wanted to watch. And according to conversations with my mom, I would literally watch it continuously on replay if you let me. This went beyond Baby's first favorite movie, since it was more than just a favorite movie for me, and I practically refused to watch and showed disinterest interest in watching anything else. I remember having a bunch of Pooh-related stuff growing up, and I can only assume that my obsession with it is what led to that. Though honestly, I don't remember a lot about that part of my life, so a better example would be one of my other first special interests, which would be my special interest in cats. Not like the play or anything, cats as in the animal. This was my special interest for my preschool, elementary, middle school, and early high school years, before a certain group of gay gems decided that they were going to come in and snatch that status away. And I only say that it's somewhat different because this is my only non-media special interest that I've ever had, and still have, but I'll get to that later in the video. For most of my childhood, I basically consumed every bit of media on cats that I could. I didn't really have unsupervised access to the internet growing up, thank god, so that usually consisted of channel surfing or literally going to the library that was five minutes away to look at pictures of or read about cats. I would also spend my recess inside at the library in school instead of going outside with the other kids, which the teachers put a stop to since they deemed it as antisocial and inappropriate. Jokes on them because I just started bringing warrior books outside and I read them while I was on the swing. I had a little black and white cat stuffed animal that I got when I was five, which I'm pretty sure is what kicked off the whole fixation business in the first place. His name is Twizzy and I love him a lot. I'll probably put a picture of him in here with Connor or something in post. I also got my first cats, Sparkles and Lily, around that same time. I've talked about Sparkles on my channel before, so I'll link that video in the info card, but about 90% of my time when I was younger was spent with my cat while surrounded by cat plushies, books, wearing exclusively cat shirts, and watching either Animal Cops Houston, Animal Planet documentaries on big cats, or My Cat from Hell. When I got access to the internet, literally all I did was watch cat videos and researched cat behavior and health problems. I literally only drew cats, and yes, I I had a warrior cats phase. What gay person hasn't? I got to the point where I was unable to finish or focus on schoolwork because every page was just lined with cats or cat-like creatures whenever there was free room. I even remember sneaking Twizzy to school while in high school and keeping him in my backpack so that I wouldn't get made fun of for essentially still needing to bring a stuffed animal with me wherever I went as a teenager for emotional support. Most of my conversations with my friends were about my cat or cat-related things to the point where I earned the name Crazy Cat lady in middle school and not as a senior citizen. I also developed an incredibly strong hatred for dogs because of how the media and overly obnoxious dog people always depicted them as the better companion and cats as the evil and lesser counterpart. I've thankfully gotten over that to an extent even though I still don't like dogs for sensory reasons, but I still loathe the media perception and tropes on cats. I honestly could probably make an entire video ranting about just that if I wanted to, but I'll spare you the details. That was the extent that this went to if it gives you any idea of what going past a neurotypical interest looks like and what a special interest in hyperfixation looks like, because none of that behavior is neurotypical. And what I just told you, there's a lot to break down that will tell you a lot about what a special interest means to someone with a mental disability like ASD or ADHD. This is going to be a little different from what I normally do since I'm analyzing my own behavior here and not a cartoon character, so bear with me. I'll go over what I said piece by piece to highlight the very common attributes. First, special interests are usually seen as a comfort to people on the spectrum. This can help us when we're dealing with sensory overload or just in general may help us get out energy that may lead to sensory overload. Partaking in a special interest is usually a pleasurable experience and is incredibly fun and exciting for us. You can see this in behavior such as the person surrounding themselves in either merch or objects related to their special interest or info dumping about it. So in my case, my my room looked like Cat Central because being around cats made me feel safe, comfortable, and happy. This is also why 
why I would wear cat shirts and sneak Twizzy to school with me because it made me feel safer. Whenever I was feeling overwhelmed, I would either go to my locker to hug and pet Twizzy or go to the bathroom to look in the mirror at the cat shirt that I was wearing. And starting even younger than that, I used to take him to preschool with me when I got separation anxiety from being away from my mom. I know that that seems kind of weird if you haven't dealt with this, but special interests are a source of repetition and structure. We know what to expect with them and therefore they can help us by grounding us in situations that can be overwhelming or lack structure, such as a public place with a bunch of overwhelming and unpredictable stimuli, like school or work. It can also become the only outlet if you're shamed for stimming, which, let's be real. The moment you flap your hands or do a behavior that's even moderately visibly autistic, you can feel the bullies and class clowns in the back of the room just waiting to call you a slur when the teacher isn't paying attention. So obviously, that isn't the best option for relieving stress and expressing yourself positively. Another important thing that you can notice from my actions when I was little was that I was seeking out all of the knowledge that I possibly could about felines, whether this was through watching documentaries or reading books. Special interests are usually heavily researched to the point of the person knowing an incredible or encyclopedic amount of knowledge on said subject. The most commonly talked about instance of this is definitely with trains, since trains are a very common hyperfixation to have among those with ASD, but popular doesn't mean only. Research can be done out of compulsion, but more often than not, it's mostly done out of passion and love because it does genuinely bring joy and comfort to the person who is researching it. One theory as to why we have special interest, actually, is because autistic people typically don't like change or unpredictable situations. We prefer to stick to structure and routine, and we like to know what's going to happen and when. Not knowing can cause extreme anxiety and cause discomfort, which can lead to overstimulation or even eventually a meltdown in extreme cases. We can ensure that we know what's going on with our special interest if we know everything about them because then nothing can catch us off guard. So we can still enjoy and consume media, but it's in a non-stressful way that allows us to avoid overstimulation or discomfort. I think that's a pretty solid theory given what we know and experience. Another behavior worth pointing out in my experience with cats is that I developed a hatred towards dogs. Not because of anything that a dog did to me, but simply because dogs were used to criticize or talk down on cats. And it wasn't just dogs either. I would get cartoonishly upset whenever anyone said that cats were bad or that another animal was better. And when I say cartoonishly, I mean I've had full-on meltdowns over it before. Going involuntarily mute, throwing a fit, going into a fetal position, crying out of frustration, the whole shebang. I think something not a lot of people realize is that people with ASD or ADHD can be incredibly sensitive to criticism. This also extends to criticism of our special interests, and we can become stubborn or very upset when someone is bad-mouthing it, to the point of it feeling like a personal attack. This is also why you have a lot of neurodivergent kids getting really upset with people for making fun of things like Five Nights at Freddy's or Fortnite, which are things that are also a very common subject of hyperfixation. It may also cause the individual to feel like they're a bad person, since liking something to this extent can certainly become a part of your identity. And so the line is blurred between whether they're simply insulting your interest or you for liking it. And that leads into my next point, which is that you can't choose your special interest. This makes the last situation potentially more frustrating if your interest is considered to be a problematic piece of media, such as Attack on Titan, for example. There are very valid criticisms and concerns about it out there, but it may be hard for someone who has it as a special interest to see the criticism as anything beyond an attack on their character. Pardon the pun. Though the opposite may also be true in that some autistic people also love to critique the things that they love. And critiquing may be how they interact with their special interest. But again, Autism is a spectrum disorder, and it's important that while discussing it and its effects not to confuse your experience with your autism as the definitive overall shared experience. Because it isn't. This is very much an individual-based disability, which is why it's very hard to both explain and diagnose it. In all of my years and through all of my special interests, I never chose any of them. For example, with Steven Universe, many of you know that I started out hating it, and I mean absolutely loathing it. My first introduction to it was the infamous Wet Bagel commercial, so I think you can understand why. But then lo and behold, it became my special interest back in 2015 when Rose's Scabbard aired. It remained my primary special interest until 2020 when Steven Universe Future ended. And then after that, my biggest interest was Miraculous Ladybug. 
Ladybug. Same story there. I hated it because I thought that, for lack of a better word, the animation was ugly. I still kind of believe that to an extent, but I'm a lot less picky now that I have a better understanding of how difficult making animation actually is. And then my next biggest special interest is Infinity Train. And guess what? Yep, same story. Initially, and you're going to laugh, I didn't like Infinity Train solely because of Atticus. And yes, it's because he was a dog, and it seemed like he was one of the main characters. So yeah, the whole cat thing, I guess, does still influence me to a degree. Most of my special interests seem to follow a pattern, so now I fear whenever I initially hate a piece of media based on something super small and insignificant. Because based on patterns with all of my special interests in the past, Hating on it is just the first step to falling into hyperfixation hell. If I roll my eyes at the first impression, it means it's love at first sight at this point. I've just come to accept it. Now, a lot of people probably are wondering how I moved on from one special interest to another so quickly, and how it seems like my first and second interests were long, but my third and fourth are short. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier in this video, it's possible to have more than one special interest at a time. My special interest in cats is still very much there, but it's what I call a dormant interest. I still have it, and will go on hyper-focus binges with it occasionally, but it isn't as prevalent as it once was. The same can be applied to Steven Universe. Special interests do not not need to be lifelong in order for them to be defined as a special interest. My primary hyperfixation on cats lasted from when I was 5 all the way until when I was 16, so that lasted for around 11 years. Steven Universe was primary from when I was around 16 to roughly 23, so it lasted for about 7 years. Miraculous Ladybug started in December of 2019 and is still ongoing. Infinity Train started in August 2019 and is still going. Miraculous Ladybug and Infinity Train are both still my current special interest, they're just in a unique situation right now where they're both my focus at the same time. So this is new for me because I've never had more than one thing that I've been able to really focus on before. Though what I've found interesting is that I'll swap between them every few weeks. So for example, right now my primary special interest is Infinity Train, meaning it's the main thing that I want to talk about but I'm still interested in talking about Miraculous Ladybug. Miraculous Ladybug is my secondary special interest and it's what I call the sleeper agent. I'll call it that because I'll go a few days without thinking about it and my primary special interest will be the main one in my head, but the moment that there's some sort of new Miraculous Ladybug content, it automatically switches back to the primary spot and kicks Infinity Train out back to secondary. And that's sort of how it's been going for me for about the past year now, just flopping back and forth between the two whenever one of them gets news, which can be super frustrating if I'm working on a video for one and then all of a sudden it loses its primary placing. So while it's still a very much consistent thing between both of them in terms of limited interest, this time the spot is shared by two things instead of one. The great thing about it for me, though, is that my hyperfixation is something that I've turned into a career for myself. Without my focus or love for animated shows, I'm not sure where I would be right now. It's pushed me to go further with my education and allowed me to see what truly makes me happy in life. I enjoy talking about these things, which is why I have such a hard time not talking about them beyond the obvious. I want to be able to use this to eventually help make and work on something truly great, and I know that eventually I'll be able to do that. Although, I hope that me going through this has helped you to understand what the experience itself is like, if only to an extent. That said, there is a fair share of potential problems and misconceptions that can come with the whole special interest thing, as I'm sure you've deduced, either by listening to me explaining my experience or by having experiences yourself. Let's get into some of those. Problems and Misconceptions one major problem that I've kind of hinted at in multiple points in this video is that special interests have the potential to make it near impossible to focus on literally anything else. Whether this be personal maintenance, work, relationships, or even just trying to keep up with other hobbies, it can have a significant and rather damaging impact on our day-to-day -day lives. In fact, in certain kinds of therapy made specifically to treat autistic people, such as ABA, special interests are commonly used as a reward for meeting targeted or desired behavior. And while I personally believe that it's a rather ableist practice, it highlights just how important special interests are to us and how we use them to interact with the world around us. For a lot of us, engaging with our special interest is a need. Whether that comes out in the form of writing, imagining, daydreaming, drawing, talking, role-playing, collecting, etc. It may seem dramatic, but it's one of our necessities. Again, I can't stress how important this is to most of us but sometimes this need can be so overwhelming that it impacts other aspects of our lives. 
Focusing in school can become hard because we can't really focus on the work or what our teachers are saying to us. This can lead to low grades and overall negative association with school, despite the fact that we usually do love the process of learning. It's just incredibly difficult or near impossible at times to find the focus or have interest in learning about a non-special interest related subject. I can't remember one required class where I paid attention for more than half of the time and my grades and GPA suffered immensely from it. College was better because I could set my own schedule and take breaks whenever I wanted. And what would you know? I actually averaged between an A and a high B in all of my classes when I was allowed to do that, whereas in elementary and middle, I was almost exclusively a C and D student. Neurodivergent kids are set up to fail in a modern school structure, but that's a whole topic for a different video. Another thing that it can impact negatively is our relationships. This is for a few reasons, but I'll cover the main point first to get it out of the way. I'm just gonna say it. A lot of people think that we're annoying. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, we know it's the truth. We aren't stupid. When we talk about the same thing over and over again, we can usually tell or we assume that you've lost interest. You can only discuss the same thing so many times with the same person before they've already heard it all and no longer find being in a conversation with you to be interesting or fulfilling. Unless, of course, you're friends with someone who has the same special interest or same hyperfixation as you, in which case there's very few things that feel as good as that. A lot of the time, this happens the most with family members. For example, my dad really has no interest in animation whatsoever, and so we don't really talk at all because he doesn't want to hear about it. I try to engage with stuff he likes, but my brain always will wander off before I really get too invested. And believe me, I have tried, like, genuinely tried. But where does my brain go? Back on the infinity train. This can lead to familial relationships weakening, especially if they don't really care enough to understand the importance of special interests and how important they are for our emotional and overall well-being. And while I personally can focus on anything that's animated, I just can't focus on something that's live action. It's impossible for me. The other way that it can affect relationships is by us forgetting to talk and keep up with friends. And this may seem kind of stupid, but hear me out. A lot of us, especially online, have friend groups that we made talking about a specific thing with. When that special interest fades, we find new friends and communities that we share that interest with. A lot of the time, we accidentally neglect friendships that we made through other hyperfixations. And it isn't because we no longer value value those people, it's that we got so caught up in this new thing that we literally forgot to go back and talk to the other people who don't share that same interest. Especially if we're hyper-focusing on something. If we forget to and neglect to eat and sleep because we're hyper-focusing, do you think that we're going to remember to reply to that text message you sent us? Probably not. And it's not a matter of us not caring. It's a matter of our brains needing this thing to function and a lot of the time not allowing us to focus on anything else. And yeah, it could come off as us not caring because we just didn't remember. But that's literally not the case and I assure you that we most likely already feel awful and are too ashamed to reply when we do remember. And I touched upon this earlier as well, but hyperfixations and hyperfocusing can also make it difficult to remember to take care of ourselves. There's been times when I've stayed up two days in a row because I'm talking to someone about something I really like, or failing to eat for an entire day because I just didn't think about trying to eat. By the time I'm able to pull myself away, my stomach hurts and I'm dizzy. And I likely was before, I just didn't notice because I was so focused on whatever it is I'm currently thinking about. Like, even as I'm writing this, my brain is currently thinking about Amelia and how her and Alric were in the 1970s England, and how that implies that Amelia's arc is one that's based on women's suffrage and feminism. May seem random, but that's how it is. And this leads to the question that I asked at the very start of this video. Why haven't I been making videos as frequently lately? It's because I'm simply finding it difficult to balance hyperfixation and putting that focus into words. It's not a lack of passion, it's actually the exact opposite. I love it so much that I want to talk about it, but I either get too excited to the point of being unable to type it out because it's all I want to think about and talk about, or my interest abruptly switches between Infinity Train and Miraculous Ladybug. And when it does that, I need to stop whatever it was I was working on involving that show and try to swap back to the video involving that I was working on previously. It's truly a frustrating cycle to be trapped in. And I don't want to imply that I'm suffering or whatever because I'm not. Most of the time, my relationship with my interests is incredibly healthy. Occasionally, yes, it does become overbearing. I just happen to be in an overbearing situation right now, but I know that it will go away soon just based on how I am and based on my history with this type of thing. 
I love my special interests a lot, and I love that I can hyper-focus because it gives me the ability and perseverance to be far more thorough than my neurotypical peers. Do I hate it sometimes because it prevents me from doing what I need to do? Yeah, sometimes I think that's fair to say, but I always say this and I'm going to say it again. Once we harness the power of being able to hyper-focus, it's all over for the neurotypicals because they won't be able to keep up with us. Not many neurotypical people that I know can sit down and write a 40-page thesis on coconuts in one day and get an A-plus on it, and I always feel powerful whenever I end up accomplishing something like that. It just becomes a problem when I can't turn it on and off, which is very much the predicament I and others like me find ourselves in. At least with Steven Universe, it was my main and only interest. It's why I was able to push myself to get consistent uploads out, because my channel in one way or another was a way for me to info dump without having anyone else to talk to about about it. Quick definition as well on that end, but info dumping is the practice common amongst autistic people of giving intricately detailed summaries of their topic of interest in single heaps. This can occur in conversation both online and offline. Speaking in paragraphs is another way to describe this. And although special interests are one of the flagship symptoms of autism and of course neurodivergency in general, it's also normal for you to be autistic and not experience this at all. And of course this also goes without saying that it's also normal if you have a ADHD and also don't have a hyperfixation. It could just be that your problem rests strictly on social cues or having problems distinguishing between tones. I know a lot of people assume that this is something universal between everyone on the spectrum, and it really isn't. It's normal to express some symptoms while not expressing others, regardless of how common they are across the disability as a whole. A lot of times people also assume that we're selfish for either talking about our special interest all the time or using our struggles to relate with others. This isn't the case at all and is actually usually a simple misunderstanding. If we share our special interests with you, it means that we care about you and we want something to enjoy and bond with you over. A lot of times, hyperfixations are very important to us and a big part of who we are and how we experience things. And so trusting you with that information indicates that we care about you and trust you a great deal. We want you to experience something that brings joy to us, hoping that it will also bring joy to you. A lot of the time too, it's the only way that we know how to interact and we want to interact with you. You don't want to break that trust by making fun of us or by getting angry. And while I've been talking a lot in this section about how hyperfixations and special interests can take over someone's life in certain circumstances, I think it's also important to mention that this is also very much a case of an individual basis, like I've been saying throughout this entire video. I cannot really explain to you guys how important it is that you that you understand this, that you know that it's an individual-based thing, because I don't want anyone to feel like they're being invalidated. With a lot of people, they may have minimal to no trouble at all focusing on other things. This is a very individualistic disability that doesn't have only one way of presenting itself. It's why we still don't know a whole hell of a lot about it, because it's just that hard to pinpoint. And just as it varies how people experience it, I'm sure that these aren't the only problems or misconceptions about it. You can always feel free to use the comments section to dump your thoughts, opinions, and experience on these things, because again, this is what I personally felt needed to be covered due to my own personal point of view. And speaking from personal experience, I think now would be a good time to go over it advice how to deal with special interests that are currently dominating your life. Advice and Management As we've discussed in this video, a special interest or hyperfixation is something that can bring a lot of joy and provide comfort to people with both ASD and other neurodivergent disorders. However, they can also sometimes cause you to become frustrated and neglect personal, professional, and academic responsibilities. So, what are some ways that you can try to cope with this? And if you're either neurotypical or just don't deal with hyperfixations, what can you do to help support your family members, friends, and peers who do? There's a few things that I've found work well for me, but they might not always work for everyone. The first thing that you can try to do is incorporate your special interest into your tasks. For example, if you're doing homework, try to imagine a character from your favorite show solving the problem or helping you with it. Or even try to rework the problem in your head so that it's relevant. That way you can now focus on your work without the stress or frustration of forcing your brain to choose between the two. It helps as well if you're able to involve it in whatever creative project you're pursuing, which is what I tended to do a lot back in English class when we wrote papers, or in art class where the project was somewhat open-ended. Another thing that I like to do is take breaks and set goals. 
This isn't as much of an option in grade school unless you have understanding teachers, unfortunately, but in college, your professor can't really stop you from leaving since, you know, you're paying them and you're an adult. If they deny you, you can bring it to the dean and tell them that your professor is not being accommodating to your disability because, let's be real, that's what that is. If you feel yourself getting distracted or struggling to focus, allow your mind a break to go back to what it wants to think about for a little while. Usually, you can come back with a clearer mind. In my own experience, trying to force myself to focus on something just makes me more unfocused than when I originally started trying to force myself and may lead to overstimulation and make my executive function that much worse. I also set goals on where I need to be before I take my break, and I can usually focus better if I know that I can let my mind wander once I finish up to a certain point. It's sort of like a reward for what I need to get done, but it's also self-governed and allowing me autonomy, and I can still always go on break earlier if I'm feeling particularly overwhelmed about it. There's also always therapy as an option if you have access to it, but it's important to not get discouraged if you can't find the correct therapist or medication right away. It sometimes takes people several tries to find either the right doctor or treatment plan, and that's fine. You're not really going to find instant results if this is an issue for you. I want to emphasize that as long as special interests don't become an issue for you, it's not really something that you need to have fixed. A lot of people have healthy and fulfilling relationships with their hyperfixations and even turn them into careers. So oftentimes they aren't something that should or need to be discouraged or managed. Really, the only time it needs intervention is when you're struggling to do everything else that you need to do for yourself and your relationship with it is more of an unhealthy and unbalanced one. There are people who don't have problems with this at all, and that doesn't make them any more or any less of a neurodivergent person. Everyone is different and their experiences are all valid. In terms of practical advice with friendships, I always live by the code that communication is the most important thing in a relationship. This goes for literally everyone though, and this is more broad advice. If you're unintentionally neglecting to talk to someone, just be honest with them and shoot them a message letting them know that you're thinking about them. It's just that your mind is making it hard for you to focus focus on talking to people at the moment. I've found that the more honest you are with your relationships, the healthier they tend to be. It also shows which people you want to remain friends with, depending on how understanding they are. If it helps or makes things easier, feel free to just send this video as an explanation if you feel it did a good job explaining your situation and experience. If I could say something to the neurotypicals who just want to support the neurodivergent people in their lives when it comes to this sort of thing, it's that it would help if you listened every once in a while. You don't need to listen every single time that we talk about it, but at least try to for a little bit. If it's something that you really just can't engage with for one reason or another, that's fine. But what you don't want to do is either make fun of the person for liking it, make them feel bad for wanting to share it with you, or get angry that they're interested in it. And yes, this includes cringe culture. It's 2021, we should have left that trend behind in the year that it started in. That's one of the quickest ways to ensure that we won't want to have a relationship with you anymore, or at the very least, a trustworthy and open relationship. A simple, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in talking about this right now, or I'm sorry, but I'm not really interested in this will suffice. But really, the biggest thing I'm asking of you is just try to be open-minded. That seems to be the most common thing that was unanimously agreed upon when I asked my neurodivergent followers what they wanted neurotypical people to understand about special interests and hyperfixations. Conclusion there is a lot more that could be said about ASD and neurodivergency and the different aspects of it, but like every single portion of it, it's complicated because of how individualized it is. I am interested in covering topics like it in the future though, but they'll need to be in another video since I can already tell that this one is getting a bit too long. And if I'm being completely honest, I really kinda just wanna watch Infinity Train again. So with that, I'm going to end this video here. If you want to see more videos like this when I get around to making them, feel free to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Special thank you to my top tier patrons, Ambrose Rothwood, Rosie Knightley, Jeffy Games, Brandon Nunes, The Lovely Ghosty, Kira Feek, Sudden Suzuki, Lee Taylor, and Zachary Ansley. Because of people like them, I can continue to make content like this. And I hope to see you all in the next video. Have an amazing day, guys.